Thank you very much. The things I'm going to talk about today, the stories I'm going to tell, they're actually very difficult for me. So if my voice falters or if tears come to my eyes, I'll apologize now before I get started. Everything I'm going to talk about today, it's all been on my blog. I'll always remember it as the day medicine broke my chief. I went to medical school at Northwestern University, and as a third year student, one of the hardest rotations was obstetrics gynecology. And the reason why is we worked 24 to 36 hours in a row, and the residents, they were tough. They were smart, uh, and they scared the heck out of us. One morning, when I was at morning rounds, and we were going over all the patients who were actively in labor, we were sitting there going over the board, I was standing right next to my chief resident. And my eyes were kind of closing, because I'd been up all night and I was tired, but my chief resident's pager went off, and I noticed that she looked at it, and out of the corner of my eye, I could see it said, emergency room, 911. When your pager says emergency room 911, you don't pick up the phone, you go. Um, she looked at me, looked at the door, and we both took off. We ran down the stairs, walked out into the cold Chicago winter across the street, and before you know it, we were in the emergency room. Now, I was a third year medical student, I didn't have a lot of experience. So when I walked in that emergency room and it was empty, I didn't realize something was wrong. It was empty because every single staff member was in the trauma bay. The only one left over was the secretary, and she looked at us and kind of pointed her head. When we walked in, I had no idea what I was about to walk into. The patient was in her 20s. When I looked down at her belly, it was big and swollen because she was 37 weeks pregnant. And she was bleeding from her neck. There was blood everywhere. Apparently, her boyfriend, the father of the baby, had stabbed her in the neck. My chief knew exactly what to do. She looked at me, she said, get me a gown, get me some gloves, get me some equipment. I ran out, I found the secretary, I had no idea where anything was in the emergency room, and she helped me find the things. We bring it back in. I helped the chief sterilely gown and glove. Um, I prepared the operative site, I put the betadine on the belly. All the while, an emergency room physician and a trauma physician were sitting at the patient's neck, trying their best to get this bleeding under control, and they were doing a lousy job at it. The chief and I looked up. We looked over the fetal monitor, and of course, we're looking at the fetal heart rate. The heart rate's 140s, 145, 130s, 120s. My chief started to get a little nervous. Come on, guys, we gotta do something. I can get this baby out. I can have this baby out in seconds. The trauma surgeon barks back at us. Patient's not stable enough, you'll kill her. So we waited. My chief was sitting there. She had her scalpel in her hand. She was sterilely gowned. She was ready. She knew that she could be into that belly, scalpel wielding, could have that baby out in no time. Heart rate goes down to the 110s, 100s. Now we're getting really nervous. Again, she speaks up. It's now or never. We either take this baby out or, or it's dying. Right at that moment, the patient's heart monitor started beeping. Ventricular fibrillation. The ER doc goes and turns around, grabs the paddles, put them on the patient's chest. The trauma physician trying to clear the field steps back. Everyone clear. His hand goes right into the chief's belly. She had lifted her scalpel so she didn't cut him. She falls backwards, falling against the wall, half sitting, half standing, trying not to break her sterility because she still wants to get in that belly if she needs to, but also not trying to cut herself or hurt anyone. One shock, two shocks, three shocks, asystole, flatline, mother died, baby died also. We walked away into the cold air, back up the stairs, and neither the chief or I really knew what to say. I mean, what do you say? This poor person died. I didn't have the repertoire. I was a third year medical student. I had never seen anything like this. But the chief didn't either, and she didn't know what to say. And when we got back to the floor, she went and she sat in the nursing station. And for the first 30 minutes, all she wanted to do was talk. So every person who came by, a nurse, a student, a resident, she went over and over again, trying to figure out what could we have done that was different? How could we have saved these people's lives? After that, she became really quiet. And she sat there at the table, and her eyes were glazed over, and you could see, you could see her hands go up occasionally because she thought she was still there with that scalpel. She was still reliving, reliving the moment. How could we have done things differently? And last of all, she started to cry, and it was, it was horrible. There she was, at the table, sobbing her eyes out, and none of us knew what to do, because she was our chief. She was our rock. We had no idea how we were going to make this better. Eventually, she took her pager, took it off, put it on the table, 
and walked away. And there I was, sitting at the table with this pager. 20 minutes later, an attending came and he got me, grabbed the pager. I finished off my 36-hour shift. I went home and I went to sleep. When I came back the next day, there was my chief at rounds. Not a word. We never talked about it again. She never discussed it. She didn't discuss it with the staff. It was like it never happened. My chief eventually left. She went to another academic center and she made a big name for herself. But I'll always remember that as the day that medicine broke my chief. Because I knew she'd never be the same. Like a soldier in battle, she had seen her first blood. She had seen her first kill. And you can never go back after that. And I know, because I remember the day medicine broke me. We tell ourselves the stories about our lives that make it bearable. Or better yet, magical, mystical. When my father died when I was eight years old, I didn't have any stories that made sense. How could this man, respected in society, a father of three young children, and a physician, an oncologist who was loved by his patients and his colleagues, how could he just disappear? I had no stories that made sense of that. And it plagued me through my childhood. But at one point, I came up with a story that, that made sense, a story that I could live with. You see, when my father died, I was eight years old. And that was just the time, just the time when I wanted to be just like him. I wanted to walk like him, I wanted to talk like him, and I too wanted to be a physician. If he had died later, maybe I would have grown out of that phase. Maybe I would have wanted to become an engineer or a lawyer, who knows. But his death concreted in me the idea that I would be a physician. And this story, the story made sense. I would grow up, I would walk in his footsteps. I would do the good that the poor guy just couldn't have done. This story carried me. It carried me through a learning disability when I was a little kid. It carried me through a move from one high school to another. It carried me through high school and college and medical school. Never did I question how I would be a doctor. It was always when. And in fact, the only time I questioned for just a little second was that first day of residency. My own head resident was walking me around. And he was showing me all the units. And he said, this is the medical intensive care unit. This is the cardiac care unit. And eventually, he brought me in front of a resident. He said, this is John. He's a third year resident. You're going to take all of his patients. This is his last day of residency. And I'll never forget, he said, John can't be hurt anymore. And I remember thinking, what did that mean? Can't be hurt. Why couldn't John be hurt? How did he develop this ability? I got busy doing the things that new interns do, trying to figure out how the hospital worked and trying to figure out how to be a doctor. But it all came to a head in my second year of residency. At Washington University in St. Louis, Barnes Jewish Hospital, where I did my residency, as a second year resident, you do a rotation in the medical intensive care unit, and every third night, everyone else leaves and you're alone. You're the most chief physician on the unit. During the day, the attendings are there, the fellows, the residents. Of course, there's always people you can call. But really, after 6 or 7 o'clock, the unit's yours. And one day, one of my residents came to me, and she said, you're on call tonight. I have this guy. He's 85 years old. His oxygen saturations are horrible. He's short of breath. We have no idea why. He doesn't have congestive heart failure. He doesn't have emphysema. He didn't have a pulmonary embolism. We don't know. Watch him overnight. If you can, try to keep them off the ventilator. Let's see what happens. As the night went on, I did the things that, that residents do. I was drawing blood and putting lines in and following up on labs. And I kept on getting these reports. Eh, he's not doing so well. We changed the oxygen flow. That didn't work. Eventually, we had the respiratory therapist come. And we put him on BiPAP to try to open up those airways. It just wasn't working. So eventually, I had to make the decision. It was time to put this guy on a ventilator. I needed to intubate him. Now, my hospital, the way you did this is a lot of times you called the anesthesiologist on call. We, as medical residents, intubated patients. That's something we did. But a lot of times, to be safe, there's an anesthesiologist in house. And so I did what I always do called the anesthesiologist on call. I got started, and I knew if I ran into any trouble, well, the guy would be coming pretty quickly. It usually takes him about five minutes. So I got all my equipment ready. I went to the bedside. I sedated the, patients, the patient. And when I started, I went to put the laryngoscope in, and I wanted to pass it to, but I, I just couldn't find the airway. Once, twice, three times, the oxygen saturations went down. I took the Ambu bag. I started breathing the patients, got them back up. I did this many times. It was only then that I started to feel the powerlessness because there was no one there. And I remember screaming out to the secretary, who I was in a room, and the secretary was all the way down the hall. I said, where's the damn anesthesiologist? They didn't come. In fact, they never came. Eventually, one of my fellow residents was walking through the ICU, and he came in and he helped me. We got the patient intubated, and I wiped the sweat from my brow, and I looked up at the monitor, asystole, patient 
something happened right in front of my face. We went, no blood pressure, no pulse. We worked on him for another 15 or 20 minutes. He didn't make it. I called the patient's family, and I remember sitting with the family in the, in the conference room telling them that, I'm sorry, the family member died, we don't know why. And the family was okay with it. It was almost as if they expected that he was dying. They kind of did what they needed to do, and then they left. It was the next morning when things really came down. I was on rounds, presenting all the new patients to the attending and the fellow residents, and I got a phone call. The secretary came up and she said, Dr. Grumman, I think you need to stop rounds and take this phone call. Well, it turned out the guy had, this was his new family that came in. He actually had three daughters who had no idea he died. I took three phone calls that morning. The first I got on the phone, she was out of town. She wanted to know, should she come in? How's her dad doing? And I had to tell her then and there, her father died. She started crying. She was so angry. And by the time I got off the phone, I moped back to rounds to start giving them again because it, I was the resident on call. I had to present all the patients. And then the second phone call came in. And when I told the second daughter, she started screaming at me. How could you let this happen? How could you let my father die? And indeed, I had. I went back to rounds again, and the third daughter called. And she didn't say anything. Silence. In fact, I didn't know whether I should hang up the phone or hold it because all I heard was silence. I could hear her breathing. She was there. I never talked to or saw any of those women ever again, but they left an indelible mark on my soul. On that day, in the ICU, I felt like I was standing on a cliff, and I was looking down in the abyss, and I so thought, I so thought that I was stepping back. I so thought that I was saving myself, but actually, I was building a huge wall around my heart. I was walling myself off from everything because it hurt. By the end of residency, I now knew what it meant that I couldn't be hurt anymore because indeed I couldn't, I was dead already. And that's what they meant. What it meant is that I could spend 36 hours in the hospital. I could deal with the most difficult, painful things. And then at the last moment be asked to make a split second decision, I could do it. And not only could I make that decision, I could then walk away. I finished residency, and I went to work in a primary care practice, and, you know, we worked in a practice where the overhead was too high, so what did we have to do? We had to see as many patients as possible in order to cover our overhead. Malpractice costs would go up, we'd worry about it. Our costs went up, we had to see even more patients. We didn't do as good of a job. It was a constant worry, and I was on a treadmill. And I think I didn't know any better. I think I would have kept doing that, but something happened. And my life changed, and my life changed in a way that I never expected. On October 25th, 2004, my son Cameron was born. And when I held him in the delivery room and I looked in his eyes, I couldn't protect myself anymore. And those walls came down in that night in the ICU. It was what it was, but I wasn't going to live by protecting myself. So I went back to the office. But things changed. I would hold patients' hands now. I'd cry with them. I'd spend extra time with them even when other people were in the rating room. I went back to being the kind of physician that I thought I was going to be before I even went to medical school. And I was better. But what does this say about medicine? What does this tell us about medical education? I had gone in with all the right ideas. I had won awards for my academic abilities and my communication skills. And yet, something happened to me. Something happened to me that, in fact, I think I'm lucky that I realized it. Because there are a lot of people wandering out there who never had that moment, that moment that fixed them, that moment that broke those walls, that moment that allowed them to do things again. Years later, I don't have any good answers to these questions. What I do know is that the death of my father and that night in the ICU were signposts in my journey. But they can't define me. Only I can do that. That second story was actually my first ever medical blog post in 2006. And at the time, I had all these things that I wanted to say. I had all these things that I wanted to tell people. But more importantly, I noticed then, and I notice it now too, we do such a good job of using social media and the internet to tell people what we know. 
but we do a lousy job of telling people who we are. And interestingly enough, telling people who we are has become really important. Back in 1999, there was a study called To Air is Human. It was put on by the Institute of Medicine. And what it showed was that 44,000 to 98,000 people a year die from medical mistakes. All of a sudden, that doctor of the 1950s who came in and saved the day started looking quite careless. Not only that, but with health care reform, politicians were painting us as people who were ordering extra tests to pad our own pockets. The truth is, we were no longer branding ourselves. We were being branded, and it wasn't pretty. And most importantly, no one was talking directly to our biggest advocates. No one was talking directly to our patients. So when I set out to write these stories, I set out to tell our patients who we are, what it feels like from the other side of the stethoscope. But as I was doing this, I actually developed an even deeper meaning. You'll hear Dr. Vardabedian and other people talk about Healthcare 2.0. Healthcare 2.0 is the idea that, you know, back before the internet and social media, we were having a unidirectional conversation. Patient came in, doctor told them what to do, and that was it. Now in a Healthcare 2.0 era, doctor and patient talk to each other, often over the internet or in social media, and it's a much more collaborative effort. What I call is a caring 2.0, for a caring 2.0 movement. In other words, it can no longer be that patient comes into our office and pours their heart out and tells us all their fears and worries, and that we stand there stone face an automaton and never give anything back. Louise Aronson is a fabulous writer, and she wrote a book called um, a, a History of the Present Illness. And in it, she says it perfectly, and I'll paraphrase here. Doctors, she says, you see, we aren't much different from our patients. Every day, we're hoping that someone will see through our elaborate and very impressive window display to the jumble of expired products weighing down our shelves and choking the aisles of our psyches. We are imperfect. And not, not only that, but the shared imperfection with our patients actually can lead to better relationships, can lead to more humility, more humanity, can lead to more healing. That's what Caring 2.0 is. More importantly, that's what empathy is. It's learning to walk in someone else's shoes. In conclusion, I'm going to continue telling my stories on the internet and using social media. And the reason why I'm going to do it is partly to be an apologist for my profession, but also to reign in this era of Caring 2.0. And I can't think of any better way to do this than social media. I'll continue to spew my anger, sadness, joy, humor out into the ether, and I'll do so with Facebook. I'll do so with my blog, and I'll do so with Twitter. Thank you.